Okay, so um, I'm calling this screen and follow. So everybody's getting a dry eye clinic nowadays. Everybody's getting into, um, into dry eye and they're trying to find out ways for treatment. But I tell people the first step really is to get something to screen patients. So I'm calling this screen and follow because not only does a patient need to feel better, you need to see that the patient is doing better. Now I've been using the Caregraph for a long, long time. Um, and uh, been using different parts of the keratograph as I get progressing along in my dry eye clinic. So the first thing that I used was the non-invasive tear breakup time. And the reason why I was using the non-invasive tear breakup time is that uh, I wanted the text to have something to do so it wasn't taking time out of my day to do all these tear breakup times. And what I'm gonna show you is the first study that we ever had published doing intense pulse light for dry eye, we actually did in, uh, tear breakup time and non-invasive tear breakup time. And one of the things that I learned is that the non-invasive tear breakup time was a little bit more sensitive than our tear breakup time, but our normal fluorescein tear breakup time, but it actually was more standardized and it's something that I could follow. So dry eye is big. I don't think I have to tell that to people anymore. I think people realize that it's a high percentage of our patients that are coming in with dry eye. The older they get, the higher the percentage gets. Uh, the type of dry eye that we mostly see is meibomian gland uh, dysfunction, uh, so evaporative dry eye. And these are the type of patients that we're seeing. This would be probably a more severe case where you have inspissated glands, talangiectasia, thickening of the lid margin, um, they have growth of bacteria, uh, injection of uh, the eye. And all these things could actually be measured with the Oculus Keratograph. Uh, so the signs that we're looking for at the slit lamp are SPK, a poor tear film, and a rapid tear breakup time. What starts to happen once you get a dry eye clinic is you'll start to get more and more patients. So when you first start a dry eye clinic, You'll have two or three patients. It's very easy for you to take a lot of time and get all these things done. But once you start getting your dry eye clinic going, you won't have time to do all these things and measure all these things and print it out. You're going to have to get text to do it. And one of the things I'm going to talk to you about is the treatments for dry eye. So what the doctor wants to do in his clinic is spend time doing treatments. You're going to have to get your text to spend time doing the diagnostics uh, and measuring uh, beforehand. So here you have a Keragraph uh, 5M. It's uh, topography is its uh, initial thing, but you can do four or five different things with this topographer uh, to uh, measure dry eye. And one of the nice things that it does is, uh, and this is, again, standardizing what you're doing. So in cataract surgery, we have sheets to standardize what the axial length is, what the uh, topography is, all those things. Now we need something in dry eye so that we can have a quick, easy look through uh, to see what's wrong with the patient and also something to uh, hand the patient. So this measures like five measures and it gives you a printout. So it measures non-invasive tear breakup time, uh, it measures tear meniscus, uh, it measures uh, mybography, uh, you can also do it to measure the lipid layer. Uh, you can use it to uh, actually video uh, these patients and what their tear film looks like. You can actually take pictures of uh, their lid margin, which is another way to kind of measure. So it's more than a topographer. So you could use it for topography. Um, and where the non-invasive tear breakup time comes in is uh, with these Placido uh, uh, disc and the Placido ring, you can actually see where these rings will start to fade as a patient keeps their eye open. And that's the non-invasive uh, part. So what I did is um, I like to see things in real time. Can we run that video? So I wanted to show how easy it is to, for your text to gather the information. Can you uh, press play on the video? So essentially, you want something very quick and easy that the text can do so it's not taking up a lot of time. 
the breadth of where you can actually measure these patients is a lot better than the other topographers that I've seen, especially when you're trying to do my biography, lid margin, and the other things. So when the patient sits down, within about 10 seconds, my staff has already gotten a whole bunch of uh, information that they can calculate and that's inputted into the, into the system. So don't think this is going to be something that wastes a lot of time, especially your time. This is something that the techs can do and they can get that information that you need within a matter of seconds. No video? Oh, okay. So what this was supposed to show is the patient sits down and we just did this in real time. That's kind of showing weird. But within, within 10 seconds, and I wanted to see real time, I didn't tell them that I was gonna be using this for a lecture or anything, I said, let the patients come in, let's see how quickly you're doing these things. And it was like bang, 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 bang. So very quick and easy, and that was measuring the non-invasive tear breakup time. So when uh, they gather this information, they can put this information into the chart. We do electronic medical records. Um, I can walk in the room and I can see the information uh, that we're getting off of, the, uh, off of the topographer. So I can say, okay, this patient has a uh, tear breakup time of less than 10 seconds. They're obviously a dry eye patient. We're going to have to do something. And again, even if you're not a dry eye person, and even if your clinic is not a dry eye specialty clinic, you're going to need this information for screening of your cataract patients and your LASIK patients. So one of the biggest reasons why people fail uh, a premium lens or fail a LASIK procedure uh, is that they're uh, uh, dry eye that was undiagnosed. Uh, and really, when you're getting in a clinic day and you've got a busy day and you've got three patients uh, waiting for you and you're doing the pre-op cataract exam, it's really hard to uh, bundle all this into one thing. Great to have a pre-screening device that if the patient fails the dry eye screening, uh, you know that you're gonna have to do some dry eye treatment before you do that LASIK procedure or before you do that uh, pre, uh, premium lens. So another thing that you can do and is tear meniscus height. So I think the, one of the hardest things to measure in a dry eye clinic is if a patient has Sjogren's disease or uh, a water problem. So most of these patients, they have a meibomian gland dysfunction. You can easily measure that with a uh, non-invasive tear breakup time. But what are you gonna do for these patients that you're worried that there's a water problem? I did Shermer's for years and years and years. It really didn't give me any information. Essentially, if you did it without any anesthesia, the patient would tear so much that it would ruin the Shermer's taste. If you did it with uh, anesthesia, the water from the anesthesia, the, the prepare cane was there, and that would affect uh, your test results. So I think this is a better way to measure if the patient does have a uh, lacrimal gland problem, it producing a water problem is taking uh, the tear meniscus. And tear breakup time to show that you're gonna have regular Myers, but once that tear film starts to break down, you're gonna get uh, abnormal Myers, and that's how it measures the tear breakup time. And again, you can see normal Myers, and then the Myers start to break down, and that's what it's gonna measure. The one thing, again, that I notice is that the uh, non-invasive tear breakup time is more sensitive than your normal fluorescein tear breakup time. So if you get a, uh, uh, a measurement of like three on your non-invasive tear breakup time, it's really about a five or six. But the more important aspect of the non-invasive tear breakup time is that it gives you something that you can follow so that you know as the patient's getting better, that non-invasive tear breakup time uh, should, getting, should be getting better. So don't get so hung up on the number, get hung up on is it an abnormal number and is the patient getting better as you're doing the treatment. And you'll see in a study that, that we, we published about this. I think one of the number one reasons why I have patients coming into my dry eye clinic uh, is redness. So you would figure it'd be pain, you would figure it would be uh, irritation or dryness. 
but it's redness. So the, the story I have on that is I had the uh, CFO of one of the most made, one of the top 100 country, uh, companies in the country, and he was, had dry eye, his eyes were irritated, but his number one reason to come see me, and he flew from far away to see me, was the red eyes. So he was tired of walking into a business meeting and somebody thinking either he hadn't got uh, any sleep or that he was doing uh, marijuana or something. So he'd come in, he'd have these bright red eyes and people would always comment, it's like, whoa, did you get some sleep last night or did you not get some sleep? So one of the things, it's really hard to document on uh, a form how bad somebody's uh, red eye is. So here you have objective scoring of the red eye so that you can visually see that the patient's red eyes is getting better but you can also document how their red eye is getting better and you can tell the patient, uh, look, you're a grade three, grade four being the worst, and now we're getting you, as we're doing this treatment, you're getting better and better and better. And we'll go on from here. So my biography. So I was telling you when I first started doing the keratograph, the major thing that I was using was the non-invasive tear breakup time. Uh, but what I'm using more now is my biography, and I'll tell you why. More of these patients are coming in, and if you look at their meibomian glands, they're shut down. Uh, and one of the things that I'm proving is that these glands aren't dead, that these glands can be revived with certain treatments. And I'm gonna actually go over, as a bonus, some of the treatments that I do. But you can revive these my, uh, meibomian glands, so don't think when you do my biography or you look at uh, the lid margin, that just because the meibomian glands are gone that you can't do uh, anything about it. Now the hardest thing to do is to prove that to doctors and prove it to yourself that these meibomian glands are coming back. The way I prove it is I actually do my biography uh, so that we can show shut down glands that aren't working, do our treatments, and then show that these glands are coming back and being revitalized. So I want people to get out of the concept of, yeah, this patient has no glands on my biography, they're a lost cause, we're never gonna get those glands back because those glands do come back. Six years ago, I presented here at, uh, at AAO uh, doing Oculus Keratograph showing that after intense pulse light treatment that we could take patients that had dead meibomian glands and bring them back after several uh, IPL treatments. Now, the good thing about uh, the Keratograph uh, 5M that I like over the other uh, Keratographs that are out there right now is that you can get the full breadth of the uh, lid margin. So most of the Keratographs that I've seen out there that are doing measurements, you can only get a small portion of uh, the lid margin and of the meibomian glands. With the Keratograph 5M, you can get all the meibomian glands on the upper lid margin, and you can get all the uh, meibomian glands on the lower mid lid margin. So you got a bigger depth of field, and that's the way they designed uh, the system. So here, you can see we're getting, we're seeing the whole lid margin, and we can get a good idea of uh, how the whole lid margin is doing uh, with their meibomian glands. And you can do the upper lid, uh, and the lower lid, uh, and very quick to take those pictures. And I think I have a, a video of that later. Hopefully it'll run. And then, again, what I want to start showing is uh, to doctors is somebody like this, you would say, okay, they had a tear breakup time of nothing. They've got no meibomian glands left. There's no fatty layer. Uh, this patient is a lost cause. And what we're showing with intense pulse light, you can actually... Uh, stimulate these glands to work better and you can go from uh, a lid margin that has no meibomian glands to a lid margin that's showing uh, meibomian glands. Oh, so, oh, trying to get back. So uh, if you know anything uh, about the work that I've been doing over the last 17 years, uh, I've been doing intense pulse light. So basically, we're using uh, wavelengths of light to stimulate these meibomian glands to work better. There's about five different mechanisms of action to uh, IPL, but the easiest one to think of is that you're stimulating uh, the cells of the meibomian gland to work better in a process called photomodulation. Uh, and then this is just a luminous uh, M22. 
And what we're doing is after we do IPL, uh, there's heat generated in the uh, dermis of this lid margin and it actually opens up the gland so that you can actually uh, express the toothpaste-like secretions in these glands. So some of the things on my, uh, my biography, when you're taking my biography, it shows like a dead gland, there's nothing going on. And what we're finding is some of these glands are actually just producing such a thick toothpaste that it's so opaque, you're not picking it up on my biography and you can't, you can't see it. But once you do IPL, you can actually open up these glands, get this toothpaste out, uh, and then you can get these uh, glands uh, working better. So that's one of the mechanisms of action of uh, IPL. And then what you'll see is as they go through IPL treatments, their glands uh, will start producing softer and softer stuff. So they'll go from like a toothpaste-like secretion to a butter-like secretion and eventually to an olive oil-like secretion. So the first paper that I ever published on IPL uh, was a three-year retrospective and actually how we got this paper published uh, is using the oculus uh, keratograph. So a lot of people were saying, well, we don't know about tear breakup time as a measure for uh, meibomian gland dysfunction and dry eye uh, because it could be variable. If we had 10 ophthalmologists and we threw them into a room and said, hey, take a tear, a tear breakup time on this patient, tell me how many seconds it is. One doctor would say three, another doctor would say five, another doctor would say four. So to combat that, to get my first paper published, I actually did tear breakup time and non-invasive uh, tear breakup time. And what we showed is, what I was telling you earlier, is that um, non-invasive tear breakup time is more sensitive to uh, tear breakup uh, than your standard fluorescein tear breakup time. But what we saw in both, whether you're measuring it with uh, uh, fluorescein or whether you're measuring it with a non-invasive tear breakup time, you could still show the progression. So again, this is a great way to get uh, you into doing and having more time to do treatment and less into doing the preliminary screening. So this is something that your techs can do very, uh, very easily and we showed it works. So I like to give bonuses whenever I talk uh, about dry eye. One thing that we're uh, utilizing a lot now is actually uh, platelet-rich plasma. So you've heard of autologous serum where you take some blood, spin it down, take the serum and make it into a drop. Well, it turns out that platelet-rich plasma, you spin the blood, the patient's blood even further, and, <coughs> excuse me, and this area here of PRP, platelet-rich plasma, actually has 20 times the amount of anti-inflammatory mediators, mediators and 20 times uh, the nerve growth factor. So this has been a, a great addition to what we're doing in our clinic to combat uh, eye pain, to restore meibomian gland function, to restore uh, a lipid layer. PRP, uh, we're introducing it to ophthalmology, but it's being used in orthopedic surgery. They're injecting PRP into arthritic knees to get regeneration uh, there. Uh, neurosurgeons are using it, so when Peyton Manning, he's a football player, I know there's some foreign people here, a quarterback for, um, uh, used to be a quarterback, he's gonna be a Hall of Famer. When he hurt his neck, they thought he would never be able to play again. The neurosurgeons did surgery and they actually injected PRP uh, there. A big thing that's happening in uh, plastic surgery right now is what's called the vampire facial. So they'll do CO2 laser, so fractionated CO2 laser on the face. They'll take the PRP, put it on the skin, that rejuvenates the skin quicker uh, and revitalizes the skin. And what we're finding, uh, and we've been doing this now for two years, is using PRP uh, can improve the meibomian glands and improve the tear film. So this is something that you could use your keratograph to measure beforehand, uh, do treatments and, and see it come back. So we actually take about 60 uh, cc's of blood and we only get about six cc's of this PRP. We make it into a drop and patients use it for about three months. Um, and again, it shows you 20 times the nerve growth factor and 20 times the amount of uh, anti-inflammatory uh, mediators. Uh, so actually these PRP machines are getting better uh, and smaller. 
Uh, my PRP machine now is about this big. It looks like a margarita shaker or something. You throw some blood in there, it high spins, and within four minutes, you get PRP. And what I'm starting to use it for is for uh, haze. Uh, so this is something that you can measure with your topographer. So you take a patient who's had PRK or some type of surgery on the cornea, they have a scar, they've got this haze, you take topography, the topography is totally screwed up. We take down the epithelium, we give them the PRP, they use it for three months. This is an actual patient, and I just saw him uh, uh, two weeks ago, and now this even little bit of haze uh, is gone, and this is with no steroids whatsoever. So we got this patient, he was a steroid responder, we got him off steroids, we've cleared out his uh, cornea, and now if you do topography with your Carrigraph 5M, you can see the patient uh, is better. And again, this was a video just to show you how quick um, you can get these things done. So this is a patient came in, sit down, and again, this is all real time, and immediately you can get those topographic rings and um, uh, get information on the patient. So that was less than 10 seconds to get the patient in uh, and out and get the information that we wanted. So conclusions, uh, we're talking about IPL and it's an effective treatment, PRP is effective treatment. I think the Carigraph 5M is a great technology. If you want to see more on how I use the Carigraph 5M, it's on YouTube and you can uh, get there. But going back to my initial, you need a screening technology and you need a technology to follow these patients. We've tried tear osmolarity, we've tried MMP9, we've tried all these other things. They're variable. You know, I can get a patient and their tear osmolarity is, is bad, they get better, and their tear osmolarity is worse. So, and, I, and I can't, so it's just a, for me, it's a random number generator. It's really not working. Same thing with MMP9, not very sensitive. So I've gotten away from using those. They're expensive. They, they, you have to charge the patient uh, for these things. It's bringing you know, more healthcare costs when it's not really giving you any information. This is something that the techs could do. You don't need to do it. Uh, it frees you up so that you can do treatment. So I think this is a perfect answer if you're gonna be doing dry eye or if you're gonna be screening patients for surgery is to get this uh, uh, technology.